Thank you to uh, RIOS, RIOS and uh, University of Adelaide for this opportunity to, to talk. Um, Andrew has given a uh, fantastic lead in to the difference of the, uh, between photovoltaic technology and concentrating solar thermal. Uh, certainly PVs you know, have, been, have tended to be distributed, benefit greatly from, uh, from smart grids and the like. Uh, concentrating solar thermal generally tends to be much larger scale power stations akin to what we've seen in, um, in our, uh, our large coal and gas-fired power stations in the past. One of the uh, advantages of that is the ability to respond quickly to, um, to a call from, from the public for deep greenhouse gas cuts. But it's also the Achilles heel because there was a, a strong uh, uh, movement to, to build solar power stations back in the 1980s and 1990s in the US. Uh, the oil price dropped. And because these power stations love to be built big, um, the investment capital just wasn't there to sustain them. And uh, the, the technologies that could be built in sort of smaller kilowatt, small modular megawatt forms tended to go ahead. Uh, another attraction is that it does utilise much of today's power gen generation technology know-how. Um, uh, essentially, solar thermal is a different sort of boiler. Uh, it's another way of making a fluid hot. And uh, that means that um, all the downstream technology, whether gas turbines, steam turbines, all the cooling systems, etc., are all of what we use today in our power stations. And so as in, in terms of tran transitioning from fossil fuel to, uh, to, to a solar uh, future, it actually makes it a lot more seamless than it may, other be, well, what it may otherwise be with a totally new technology. Uh, one, one attraction um, is, that, uh, is the ability for, for integrated storage. Uh, storage has come up uh, quite a bit already. Uh, solar thermal can actually provide base load, dispatchable power, if it was ever required. But really, to, uh, to put in the, the sort of storage, an extra mirror area, and, um, and the capital cost to, to provide 24-hour base load storage would never get the internal rate of return back to justify that sort of expenditure. So many of the power plants going in in Spain and the US at the moment are going in with either a few hours or up to about six hours storage because um, ultimately uh, your, your price signals, your, 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 your good price signals, are coming around about six to nine o'clock in the evening when uh, the air conditioners come on, etc. cetera. Um, producing solar power at 2 a.m. in the morning, your price signal's down here. But if you can just put in six hours of storage, you've moved the sun from 3 p.m to, uh, to 6 to 9 p.m. And, uh, and that's when you're making most economic uh, use of your solar energy, of, of your storage. Um, uh, nicely, um, especially in a state like, uh, like South Australia, it has a capacity for hybridisation, not only with, with gas, but also with geothermal. One of the, uh, a lot of attractions with, with geothermal, the hot dry rock geothermal, but it comes out at a very low temperature compared to what steam turbines generally like to use. Solar thermal can easily go to five or 600 degrees Celsius. Geothermal these days is coming out of the order of 200 degrees C. Um, the, the turbine efficiency is a lot higher if you can go to higher temperatures. And so having solar thermal on top of the geothermal source could make a lot of sense for the future. Uh, the other thing is they're, they're, they're usually both out in the boondocks and so they, they sit nicely together. Um, I mentioned before that uh, one of the Achilles heel was the fact that they, they love to be, be, to be built big. And there, there is a, a technology drive these days to develop new technologies based on small gas turbines, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that um, doesn't require water, can be built in sizes of about one megawatt up to 10 megawatts each. You can then sort of add, add groups of them together to build a cluster of, of megawatts if you like. But the, the attraction is you don't have to go and find the capital for a, for a 100 megawatt turbine. You can actually do it in much smaller quantities and um, that's good from the, the, the financial perspective. Um, and importantly, what we have uh, in the world today and some of the photos I'll show shortly is not where the technology finishes. There's a lot of, lot of room for fertility in new ideas, both in collector technology and also in um, uh, uh, going along nicely with the advances that are coming out of the power generation industry in new advanced turbines. Uh, why would I spend um, uh, some of my precious minutes talking about a, a coal-fired um, slide? But it, it, it's quite important. 
this this uh, hook, hook back um, well, that, that one, one there, there this one. Um, along the the bottom here um, uh, the uh, timeline starting from um, around about 1880 when the first um, Rankin cycle coal-fired power station was built um, up to to whoop, the wrong one again sorry <laughs> up to uh, up to, to 2050. And on the, the vertical axis here, we're talking about thermal efficiency. Um, if we had to start today with a, we're right from uh, the word go with solar thermal and had to start where the coal industry started 120 years ago with efficiencies down below 10% compared to the efficiencies of, of up above 40% today, it would take us an awful long time to get to anything that was going to be competitive or useful. Um, Solar thermal, however, uses all of that, that 120 years of experience that's already in the pipeline and um, already deployed out there and builds on top of that. So there's no waiting around. It can go right in right now. These, uh, these trough power stations have been operating for over 20 years in, in California. There's uh, more than 2 million square metres of troughs like these operating over there. And they've been operating in a commercial environment too. Um, they've been operating very reliably. In fact, the only year where there was a slight dip was when Pinatubo erupted in, um, in the 1990s sometime over in the Philippines and that ash cloud drifted over. But uh, apart from that, they, they've uh, exceeded their, uh, their commercial expectations every single year. These particular troughs work by uh, heating oil in these tubes along here up to around about 370 degrees 370 degrees Celsius and uh, generating steam for a standard steam turbine power station over here. More recently, um, uh, new technologies have started to be deployed and in Spain, these, uh, these solar towers are out there now. Uh, many people believe that, that this sort of higher temperature technology may be the way of the future and eventually take over from the, the linear trough type power stations. Um, the, here we have uh, individual mirrors on the ground, each mirror tracking the sun in both axes and shining that sun, reflecting that sun back up onto a central point where, where steam is generated. It's very important that as we, uh, as we, we try and uh, reduce the cost and improve the efficiency on into the future that we have both um, R&D and deployment of these power stations <coughs> working together. Take, for example, um, one, one of those power stations I just showed. And uh, a, more than 40% of the capital cost of these power stations is in, is in the solar field there um, and, and in the tower itself. So if you can make an impact on, on the solar field, um, you, you can make a great impact on the capital cost. If we increase operating temperature from about 350 degrees up towards 550 degrees, we can improve efficiency by 25%. And, uh, that significantly reduces the, cap the, the area of mir mirrors that you need to install and therefore the capital cost goes down. So efficiency leads to, to capital cost reduction. I don't know whether you could, can, can read that quite so well but um, I, again I'm just um, um, over time and um, cents per kilowatt hour up here looking at, the, looking at what are the methods, what are the uh, ways in which we can reduce cost over time. This pink, uh, pinky purple line up here represents business as usual. If we, um, uh, CSP concentrating solar power will benefit from three things, economies of scale, mass production and efficiency improvements. Uh, we see here that uh, economies of scale, just building the plants bigger, could lead to up to around a 20% reduction in, in the overall capital, uh, capital cost and levelised electricity cost. Another 26% coming from um, mass production, so just building uh, more and more of the same thing and uh, just coming down that learning curve that way. So together you've got economies of scale and mass production leading to just over 50% of your cost reduction. Um, uh, just under 50%. The other 50% coming from improvements in materials, breakthroughs in uh, temperature increases, improvements in efficiency. Where are we in the world at the moment? Um, Spain and the US are, are driving the world CSP market right now, and it's a it's a really nice example of how um, uh, appropriate financial um, 
uh, regulations can lead to, to a whole new industry. Um, the capacity in operation at the moment, just under uh, 700 megawatts, and the majority at the moment is in the USA. But uh, this number in Spain is increasing quite rapidly at the moment. Um, as you can see here, the capacity under construction right now, this is at, back at February, so I should update this, but uh, there's nearly 900 megawatts under construction in Spain right now. Um, in the US, uh, just in the last couple of months, two new power stations, 400 megawatt um, solar tower power stations made up of the four 100 megawatt towers um, have had all their final approvals um, put in place, so they're proceeding. And another uh, 280 megawatts of that trough type technology announced by Avangoa. So um, US have, have just um, significantly added to, to that little slice of the pie there. And an enormous amount um, under various stages of planning. How do we get this sort of a new technology like this in place? Uh, looking from, from where we are today, up along the, uh, the, the timeline, in the early days, we're going to need subsidies in some form or other. In, in, in Spain and Europe, it's in the form of feed-in tariffs, as Andrew mentioned before, um, and, and they're quite significant feed-in tariffs. Tariffs that will go down over time as the technology goes up in terms of deployment. In the US, it, it's actually through uh, capital investment credits and, um, and loan guarantees. So there's different mechanisms, but that's going to be needed initially. Uh, once those plants are in place, then uh, green pricing, CO2 pricing, a CO2 price could take over. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, the cost of other fossil fuels is going up, cost of solar is coming down. And I would say by 2015 to 2020, there's a very good chance of them meeting. Um, the future, just very quickly, uh, the next generation of CSP technology, increasing the temperature of steam and storage. Um, a waterless air turbine, I'm, I'm, uh, we're actually building a, another uh, solar tower just over here at the moment, and that's going to have a, a 200 kilowatt micro turbine, a small gas turbine, sitting on top, running off air that we heat to 900 degrees Celsius, so it doesn't need any water. The other one is solarised fuels. You can actually uh, use the sun and, and natural gas to, uh, to create solar liquid fuels, but ultimately, um, a bit of work going on in Australia and a lot in the US at the moment using the sun, CO2 plus water to make fuels down the track. So, um, a vision for Australia. We have missed other boats in the past and uh, CSP is sort of right at the start of the, uh, the curve at the moment and uh, this would be a really good boat to get on, I think. I can see us being a, uh, a part of a global hub of solar energy expertise um, in, in South Australia, Queensland, um, uh, uh, Canberra and New South Wales, there's a significant amount of world leading expertise in solar thermal. An exporter of solar energy through liquid fuels or through the technology itself. What would it look like? Um, uh, 50k by 50k of Australian desert, there'd be enough area in there, including all the gaps in between mirror panels, etc., to provide all of the electricity that Australia would use in 2020. Um, but that's, that's, uh, that, that's asking a lot. So what if we just go for a 25% target? 25% of Australia's mixed by 2050. Uh, we would need 25, concent well, 25 solar power stations. In fact, they don't need to be, concent to be solar, uh, concentrating solar power. They could be photovoltaics. But each one using land of just five kilometres by five kilometres, that's less than one per year. And by 2050, we'd have 25% of our mix from, from there. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I think that uh, the, as I stand here talking and telling you about this uh, uh, technology and uh, my, my vision for the future, someone in Germany, someone in the US, someone in Spain, someone in Japan is doing it to their country as well. So, uh, you know, we, we've all got to get in this together, I think, and um, uh, there'll, be, there'll be commercial interests, of course, but I think there's a really strong opportunity for, uh, for the world to go ahead with this technology. Thanks. Thank you, Wes. Um, well, I've got a question about energy security. And that, um, let's assume there's a bushfire, and for three days or more, we don't actually see the sun. What do we do? Um, I do not advocate that uh, there will ever be a, a single 
technology answer to any to any um, uh, grid in the world. There's always going to need to be a, a, a provision of electricity coming from, you know, at least three, maybe four or five different different sources. And so, in, in the same way that if a coal-fired power station fell over uh, because there was a strike on from the coal miners or whatever, which could go longer than three days, um, they can continue operating. The same here with. Uh, uh, solar thermal, hopefully there won't be just one power station, uh, but there would be many others over a geographically dispersed area. So you've got that geographical distribution, but you've also got other technologies in the mix as well. Let me ask you about water. Uh, you mentioned some of it in there, in that uh, most of the um, high solar flux is in arid area where there's no water, yet um, you need water for your uh, cycles, you need obviously water for your the cooling side. So how do you overcome this problem? Well, um, uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of low-hanging fruit sites um, where uh, you get your, your transmission, your, um, your land, your sun, your water, and maybe your gas backup, all there together. And there's going to be some number of sites in countries like Australia where all of those come together and, and you will use those sites. Same things happen with wind, you know, you pick your best sites and, um, and, and, you, uh, and you use them first. Um, however, uh, over, over time, um, uh, those sites are going to be used up. So dry cooling technology is available. That's used in um, at least two power stations, two large coal-fired power stations in Australia at the moment. They don't use water for cooling, they use air. It's a little bit less efficient, it's a little bit more expensive, but you don't need water. The last question is, um, if we're going to concentrate the solar energy, can we use it directly? And is it more <laughs> efficient, for example? say, for mineral processing? Uh, yes, it, look, if you, if you can avoid the, the, the Rankine cycle or the, or the Brayton cycle, that's, that's where the biggest single efficiency drop occurs in, 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 in the cycle um, to produce electricity. If you can use that directly for um, uh, high temperature heat for, for, for metallurgical processes, for mineral processes, that, that's the, the most efficient and cost-effective way of doing it. Good. Please thank. Uh, join with me thanking you.